Hello again. Now, in this high point of the year, we're going to look at one or two crucial areas with regard to the sacred liturgy, collocating it in the specific element of what we are doing this very week. But it applies also to the whole year and to the whole of time. I want to look precisely at this question of time and its place in the liturgy. It's an issue that we cannot avoid. It's an issue which actually is linked, strange enough, directly until the end of time with the liturgy itself, as I'll try to explain as we progress. Interestingly enough, in the period immediately after the Council, the French Church, the French bishops, published the interim version of the breviary, the one which we had as prayer of the Church, you may remember, in the early 70s, it was the interim. Well, in French, that came out as prière du temps présent, prayer of the present time. And it is very well put. The word that we're used to, breviary, has the root of brevis, short, and horarium in it. It was the manageable monastic, essentially monastic, office that was in the hands of those who were out of choir. And it was the prayer that the church imposed on all those in major orders. It was, therefore, not just a human devotion. It was the voice of the church itself. If such a severe obligation was imposed as an agreement from the moment of ordination that there would be this, in Latin, pensum, this duty, officium means duty, office is duty in Latin, of praying for the church, for those who were called to the service of the altar were given the commission to pray without ceasing, and this was the way in which it was handled. Time until death was sanctified by the moments of the church, the canonical hours. Canon, canonical, it's the root of rule, and this was the rule of prayer of the part of the Lord. Kleros, the clergy, is the Lord's part, the Lord's portion, and the Lord is our portion. And then, in the period after the Second Vatican Council, the fact that it was possible now to pray in the vernacular, this pensum, this official prayer of the Church, meant that it was opened also, firstly, to all religious, including females, sisters, nuns, all over the world, and then also to all Christian believers who were invited warmly to associate themselves with this supreme form of prayer, which is not just devotional, but is the voice of the Church itself. St. Magdalene the Pazzi, a Carmelite mystic, was given to understand that one single prayer of the Divine Office far surpassed that of any private devotion because it was precisely the prayer of the Church. And it is good to see that that has taken off after the Council. Many lay people do use part or all of the Divine Office and therefore are in union with all their brethren throughout the world. Indeed, in coming back to Ireland, I consciously chose to use the prayer which is massively used throughout the Catholic world, that of the Roman breviary as we have it, but in its expanded form for monks. That is, you can make it longer by doing all the possibilities that are there, which are not of obligation for those who have an active life. But one of the invitations given by the Vatican to contemplatives was to have more at the Office of Readings. That is to say, one makes a second or even a third nocturne. It's quite simple. One has week one and week three, week two and week four. And then one puts the second reading of the Office of Readings after the second batch of psalms. And then on Sundays and feast days, one has also the third nocturne. That is, 
the, those canticles and gospels found in the appendix part, the end of the breviary, each volume of it. And so we have also a very good divine office, even if one is using the shortened form, which is that of the Roman breviary as we have it, because one can improve on the quality by having what is invited in the invitation given in the beginning of the book, the instructions, to have inserted pauses. That is the optic of reducing the quantity. It is so as to have more in the way of quality and calm. Quality in the way in which every word is taken in calmly and meditated upon without the notion of getting to the end of it, which is what mentally enters in if one has a very large number of words to execute, but also with regard to the celebratory mode. Always here in the Hermitage I sing everything, and it means that it is a celebration and not a private devotion at all at all. It is genuinely a feast of praise in the heart of the night and in every canonical moment of the day. It is la prière du temps présent, prayer of the present time, on behalf of the Church, and also in something of the angelic mode of the angels who always sing their praise. And they are there before the tabernacle, worshipping, especially one feels it in the hours of night, alone there in the utter silence, one knows that one is not alone. And therefore it is genuinely the whole Church praying the Divine Office, precisely when it is needed. For this element of the night prayer is extremely powerful, and of course old Nick knows it. And that is one trick that he has actually managed to succeed in bringing about. Diminish the night prayer. That is, bring the rise ever later into the day so as not to have that intimate moment. He does it bit by bit by, for instance, multiplying the things that are happening late into the night. E.g. catching up on emails or whatever it might be. It could actually be far worse. And that is, of course, something which obliterates the notion of time. We're getting to the end of whatever has to happen, has to happen, has to happen. And, of course, the first thing to go is the early rise and all that, all that might grow with it in regard to vicarious and reparatory prayer for the whole church. The devil knows it full well. And when it impinges upon the horarium of a monastery or a convent, he has a great victory. Because then, as a island of prayer in the church, one part of the church is losing its privilege. The lighthouse has been extinguished in the night. That beacon of light has gone out and we're having more of the same thing. Just going to bed late and not having that virginal moment and also at the moment of acting against the forces of darkness and that gives of course the devil greater freedom at night. So this night prayer is important and indeed when it came to adapting the breviary to modern times the instruction was still kept there that with regard to the office of readings in choir, that is when it is said in those houses where ha having it still together as a group, it is actually still of nocturnal character. It is therefore an invitation to maintain the night office for those groups to have the obligation of the canonical hours. So all that to say that the element then of using in the first instance what the Church gives us as the basis of our prayer is the providential grace that we have. It's a big difference between ourselves and our separated brethren. They don't have this notion of exactly praying the same prayer right throughout the Christian world. They pray, of course they do, but they don't actually have the same basis of it. Because the great benefit of having the same words, the same texts, the same meditations of all our brethren throughout the world is that we have that power of unison. We are genuinely saying the same thing and praying the same prayer and we feel our brethren meditating the same texts right throughout the world. It's extremely powerful. Now, with regard then to this element of time sanctified, chiseled out and indeed consecrated and elevated, that is our business. And therefore, let's look at one or two issues that concern us with regard to the rights of God over time. In giving us this heavy obligation, this duty of completing the prayer of the church before we go to sleep each night, there is also the strong indication given in the instruction that there should be what is referred to as the veritas horarum, the truth 
of the hours. That is a strong reaction against what might be happening before the council reforms when this notion of duty was so strong that in practice it was done quite often in big bungles. Several hours were combined into one, the duty was accomplished before midnight, but nevertheless the truth of the hours sometimes was sacrificed. Now in reducing the quantity we can recuperate the authenticity and we can celebrate time, we can celebrate the hours as they are mentioned in the prayers and hymns of the hours. It is beautiful actually to be uniting our prayer to that of the dawn chorus when it comes to the Benedictus singing the canticle of Zechariah. There talking about the Oriens Exalto, the dawn which is rising from on high. It is that which has accompanied the dawn from the earliest centuries and is common to all the churches that have a liturgical praise. Even the Anglicans still use it at their morning prayer. And then when it comes to the other high points like the Canticle of Our Lady at Vespers, it is a wonderful combination with the solemnity of the night and conclusion of the day. In feast days, that is often used actually with incense. And then with regard to the last canticle, that of Simeon, it's a wonderful conclusion to the day. And it can be done actually lighting one or two candles, indicating the light, because we are praising the light there as we come to the end of one more chunk of light and go to sleep in the hours of darkness which are then sealed well not by television but by the song of praise accompanied of course classically with the use of a blessing and holy water it's very beautiful to go into a quiet monastic bed having been blessed by the superior and then of course the night silence in globes and it is a cushion to the praise and prayer of the night. Classically, in monasteries, the hood is worn between Compline and the end of Mass. That is, 24 hours are divided into 12 and 12, and 12 of the 12 are in the Summum Silentium, no word at all. And that is intimacy with Jesus on the mountain, reproducing in our life that chunk which is God's alone. And to encroach upon those night hours, it's not healthy because we lose the balance and we become activist, we become noisy, we become fidgety. If there is not that half and half between action and contemplation, we will lose our raison d'être very easily. And it is the beginning then of crises because God can't get through to us. We lose our identity of intimate friends of Jesus. We are perhaps still functioning, but when the night goes to many, 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 many things, God can't get through. And if those things can be adjusted, because they're not always necessary, it must be happening. We need to pause, especially in these high moments of praise, like Holy Week, to listen to God and his whisperings. Maybe he has something to say to us this Holy Week. Am I running too quickly over time and missing these sacred appointments? For if we are... Then perhaps we will come to the end of our copybook, running out of pages, running out of time, running out of seconds, and realizing we were doing too many things. I would like, at midday now, to pause for a second to look at what is happening when we pause and claim time for God. If our Muslim brethren see fit to do the same, and in so doing, to deny, because that is essentially what they are proclaiming, then we need to be aware that God wants us to pause well, to think about our salvation, to be fully aware of the link between heaven and earth, especially when we are praying with all our brethren throughout the Christian world. These moments have been sanctified from the early church. The more closing of the day and midday are in the earliest Christian prayer. We have it already in the Acts that there are moments of prayer. Of course it comes partly from the synagogue and from the temple but it was seen very clearly from the earliest times that time was to be broken up. That we were to come back to God out of time 
in sacred pause. Therefore, if our brethren in the Islamic bloc insist so much upon this, even though it is actually automated in most mosques nowadays, how much more should we pause and puzzle, venerate and honour, think of the way in which the angel came, the angel who was a bridge between heaven and earth, and asked on bended knee for permission to act, because God being the great gentleman, that angel needed permission to act. God would not invade, God would not save against the will of man. And that is actually an invitation every time a bell calls us to prayer. The Angelus ringing is indeed vox delecti, the voice of the beloved. That is actually written, chiseled on one of the bells of the Grand Chartreuse, or actually of Selignac where I was. It is an invitation every time the consecrated bell rings to realize that is not just noise. I am being called politely by this mechanical angel. God would have me pause and honor the Angelus bell as he would have me honor in the monastery the bell calling me to prayer. And indeed that beauty of a bell calling is something that we need to honor and respect. It is not just a noise in the dark. Sometimes people have been called strangely by these bells. There was one time in Paris a man who was abusing his life as a young man and one day he was going to bed after a night of debauchery and he heard the bell calling the Carthusian monks to midnight office and something hit him. Look how these brethren are using time and look how I am. And he was touched by grace and he went to the monastery and asked if he could be admitted and admitted he was and he lived in faithful obedience to that bell until he died. Well time is passing us by and we can be in some kind of irregular mode all time, never in control of our time and if we completely ignore these invitations of the clock. So the Angelus is a pause to be honoured and the beauty actually of kneeling as we do in Ireland at the third clause and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us places us already as it were virtually in the Holy Land where this was born. So when the Crusaders and the Franciscans saw the need to take on something as a counterbalance to this Islamic devotion of the Imam or rather the Muetzin according to prayer there is a reason for it in divine providence and we need to pray well these prayers not just rattle them off it is actually very beautiful to honor god at that moment now there is actually in guardini a wonderful passage about the mystical notion of what is happening at midday noon he says is a profound moment in the stir and extroversion of a city it passes unperceived but in the country among cornfields and quiet pastures, when the horizon is glowing with heat, we perceive what a deep moment it is. We stand still, and time falls away. Eternity confronts us. Every hour reminds us of eternity, but noon is its close neighbour. Time waits and holds its peace. The day is at the full, and time is the pure present. Now this is kind of important. Time is the pure present. The secret of living the life of grace is to live it as it comes to us. The doctrine of Corsad, a Jesuit there, way back centuries ago, still holds firm. The sacrament of the present moment, that each moment contains in it all that is necessary in the way of grace and providence for our sanctification. But we have to absorb it when it's there. And that is our tragedy. We are not living in real time. We are living in virtual time, preparing the next moment or regretting the last one. We are not there where grace is passing and therefore we are not catching grace when it is being conferred upon us. It's extremely important both in the prayer of the hours that we are actually attentive and receiving the grace by it being fully switched on 
and also in the sacramental life itself, when we are fully plugged in to all that's around us. There are certain high points of the year, such as this Holy Week, when that is maximally the case. There is much grace in the air this week, and we need therefore not to miss them by doing now what could wait for other moments. For grace is something delicate, and finds it hard to get through a smoke screen of activity and hyperactivity especially. The day being at its height and eternity close by, let us attend to it and give it entrance. In the distance, the Angelus, breaking the noontide silence, reminds us of our redemption. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The angel of the Lord brought the message to Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Ghost. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy will. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, when we actually pause and, in a sense, see the angel coming, that angel also, in the sense of grace at that moment, is coming unto us. And as with the Blessed Virgin, the angel was there humbly on one knee, begging permission to act, so too grace is coming to us, begging permission to act. God does never oblige. And so every encounter with heaven is heaven's courtesy. Would you like me to act? I can't oblige you at all. God is the perfect gentleman. Therefore we are free, yes, to say the Angelus or not say the Angelus. We're free or not to say this or that prayer. But if we neglect regularly these moments of encounter, then we are actually deflecting grace. Grace increases in proportion to our reception and our collaboration. As St. John says, grace in return for grace. That grace increases every time we say yes, and greater grace comes again. So this acceptance and collaboration of every soliciting of grace is important. At the noon hour of man's day, in the fullness of time, a member of the human race, on whom this fullness had come, stood and waited. Now Mary was calm when the angel came. She was not flustered or fidgety. That is how grace finds us open, not agitated, but in mode of reception. Mary did not hurry to meet it. She looked neither before her or after. The fullness of time, the simple present, the moment that gives entrance to eternity, was upon her. She waited. Eternity leaned over. The angel spoke, and the eternal word took flesh in her pure womb. Now in our day the Angelus proclaims the mystery. Each noonday, for each Christian soul, the noonday of mankind is again present. At every moment of time, the fullness of time is audible. At all times our life is close neighbour to eternity. We should always hold ourselves in that quietude that attends upon and is open to eternity. Now, with regard to the way in which the Holy Spirit has given us a pattern of prayer, it is found already in the Acts. We found the third hour being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We find noon. We find the third hour. We find Peter in prayer at the hour of prayer. We find the apostles going into the temple at the hour of prayer. There were all moments of prayer coming in already, and we find them in the early church fathers. But we have in our time the invitation given by heaven to sanctify in a particular mode the hour of our redemption, par excellence, three o'clock in the afternoon. This is something which we are living as the generation which has had the explosion of this message from heaven and its diffusion throughout the world of the divine mercy, and it is precisely in this year, maximally opened by our Holy Father, wanting us to receive all the benefits of the redemption, again, if we wish. But the Lord has, through St. Faustina, indicated the power of pausing at three in the afternoon. He gave her to understand how there was a power of impetration when we plugged into the power of Calvary at that point, asking for things, asking for mercy, the floodgates of heaven were open. 
now, we are in the hour of mercy, we are in the year of mercy, and we will be on the feast of mercy. Very soon, Divine Mercy Sunday, it's like a second baptism if we follow through the indications given by our Lord to St. Faustina. Again, time, when time, as it were, is standing still and fully receiving the maximum from the cross. These moments are there every day if we pause. Therefore, it is not indifferent if we have this reaction to sanctify physically by pausing mentally and bodily at these holy moments. There are ways and means of making it happen. One can, for instance, in the modern mobile phones that we have, put on not just one alarm, but several. One can put a, one, two, three, or four, and one of them could be the Angelus, the other could be the three o'clock prayer. They are then reminding us whatever we're doing by ringing in our pocket, pause, this is holy time. And if we do that on a regular basis until we die, look at all the moments we have set apart. Because humanly speaking, we are so engaged in the immediate occupation that in practice it will not happen unless something rings to remind us. In quite a few Catholic countries, in Bavaria, Austria, even in parts of Italy, the hour of the Passion every Friday rings out with a big bell in several churches. It's a beautiful devotion, three o'clock ringing there on a Friday, an ordinary Friday. It reminds us of the blood that redeemed us. It is accomplished, said the Lord at that hour, and it was the cosmic hour when the gates of heaven were once more opened up. Today you will be with me in paradise. Well, these are moments when we can engage with heaven fully and receive the benefits of our redemption. In practice, if we are in the world without a monastic structure or anything calling us at all, the practice will not be there if we're realistic. Therefore, we have to be inwardly structured and be aware of our reality as human beings. It needs not less but more effort when there is no visible structure to have our own interior structure and to have these instincts of pausing. In places where clockwork still functions to make a chime happen, e.g. every quarter, and certainly at the bell of the hour, there can be still that ancient devotion, dear, for instance, to the Curé Vaz, Saint Jean-Marie Vianney, to have a pause and a prayer. If, for instance, when we hear the hour striking, we say a prayer such as, Eternal rest, grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them, may they rest in peace, Amen, then we are actually able to gain an indulgence. That prayer is indulgence, it, there's a partial indulgence there, it's still valid, it was in the Handbook of Indulgences published by Blessed John, uh, Paul VI after the Second Vatican Council, the ones that were still maintained, and that is definitely still there as an encouragement to pray for the souls of the faithful departed. Well, if we do that on a regular basis, every hour, until death, think of how many souls we will have helped by the moment of our own death, and also the way in which, by pausing at that rhythmic pace of every hour, or even every quarter, but certainly every hour, if we do that, then also we are ourselves reminding ourselves of our limited state, that time is always running out, and each hour we have one hour less, and one hour more having been spent on our copybook written forevermore. For time is written, writ large, in indelible ink on our history book. The book of life one day will show us what we did and didn't do. Time is writ large, and therefore it's important that we appreciate it and pause in these segments of hourly coming apart. Back to base, back to base, back to base. We should always hold ourselves in that quietude that attends upon and is open to eternity. But since the noise of living is so loud, let us pause at least at noon, at the hour the church is sanctified, and set aside the business we are engaged in, and stand in silence and listen to the angel of the Lord proclaiming that while the earth lay in deepest silence, the eternal world leapt down from his royal throne. 
then into the course of history. For that, once only, but since then, at every moment, into the human soul. Now I return for a second to this question of the way in which God is courteous. Hilary Belloc has a poem, Courtesy, on the theme of the angel kneeling before the angel, before our blessed lady, rather, wanting that word, fiat, permission to act, if you wish. Well, it happens actually every time a grace comes to us. We have the power, the power, the key of the will, and we alone detain it, we alone hold it, and we can say yes or no to every solicitation of grace. And grace is hugely at work all the time in the life of the soul in the state of grace. God is engaged. E.g., there's a world of difference between each time we engage in some form of prayer, whether it be such devotions as the Angelus, or the prayer of the office itself, to be engaging with it in precisely engaged mode, or in absence from what we're doing. Because if we're not careful, we are not actually engaging with what we are doing if we do much in the way of prayer. That is an illness, and it's something to be looked at, because the whole thrust of the reform of the Second Vatican Council in the realm of liturgy was to insist upon this element of engagement, because, unfortunately, the heavy burden of words had led to an illness, and that was that people actually were not really engaging with the words. They were getting through them. So that has been a problem that has to be addressed. But if we do more of the same thing, we will not appreciate what the Spirit was trying to say to the churches. Therefore, it's important that we genuinely engage with the words. Now, I just make one parenthesis. There's a big difference between actually celebrating the liturgy in our own language, what Paul VI called the language of the heart, linguaggio del cuore, and using another language, I mean in practice Latin. Because in practice, quite often what we do when we're actually praying in Latin is that if there's a large number of words, we don't actually engage necessarily in the same way. It can happen, but the tendency is not to do it in the same way as a smaller number of words in our own living language. There is, therefore, a potential bomb which we need to detonate, we need to explode, otherwise we'll have more of the same thing, that is, not again engaging with the power of truth in the word. So it's important that we, therefore, have the possibility of engaging through pauses which allow the word to settle. Because one unstoppable flow of words, whether in the liturgy of the Mass itself, or in the Divine Office, or any other prayer for that matter, is self-defeating with regard to that renewal of prayer which the Spirit wanted in the churches. It's important that we have this cushion of absorption and echo. The word needs time to settle. Therefore, between each psalm and after each reading, we need a pause to let it settle and go in, to unpack the grace and listen to the voice of the spouse. I pause there for a moment. Now, in this last section, I want to attack one point which is related. It is the corollary. If time is claimed by the one who gives it to us, then we must at all costs address the illness of hurry. Because as we saw with the way in which our Blessed Lady was calm and collected, not looking back in time or forward in time, but there at the present time of the coming of the angel, the intersection between time and eternity, between heaven and earth, so too in our prayer we need to be in unhurried, calm mode, totally collected in the present moment, not anticipating, not regretting, not demolishing it by taking it too quickly. God is outside time and he is frustrated when he finds us too much in a hurry to get to the next moment. As actually in human relationships, quality time is there when two people can be quietly not vocalizing their presence to each other, when we still need that 
element of vocalizing, of cancelling silence, then we're not quite encountering each other in the fullness. People who really know each other, just after a while, after a long while, are more at ease with the sound of loving silence. Words can be superficial contact. So too with our God. If we are so much aware of time, then I'm afraid we're going to miss the adventure of love. For in the last resort, it is love which is our business in liturgy. We are finding a language in which God can be at home and praised. Remember now, music is the language of beauty. And in creating an atmosphere, we are creating a virtual home for God in our atmosphere here on earth. A place where the angels and their king are happy to be with us. But that also needs a cushion of calm. We need somehow to be celebrating without being aware of the celebration, in automatic pilot as it were, but somehow gazing at Jesus with all else being a natural and spontaneous outworking of what is there. It can't go from the outside to the inside. So, this element then of giving enough time is to be addressed, especially in certain cultures, because we're contaminated by our pace of life. Indeed, I remember one time in Italy, I was giving some talks to enclosed nuns. They were poor clares, a very good convent with lots of vocations. But this indication was given straight away by the Mother Superior that because the Mass was that also of the people before they went to work, it couldn't take more than such and such a time. And it was fairly short. Therefore, I thought to myself, it's great for the people to be there, to benefit from this. But the nuns are missing out from that calmness which we have in our own monastery where actually time did not enter into the equation because God cannot be measured by the clock. Indeed, Pope Francis has actually reacted strongly against this and said that we should not be looking at our watches in the liturgy because time is of a different order when it comes to praise. We need rather to look both at our charismatic friends and also at our Eastern Orthodox friends who don't measure praise and glory by the second but have time to relax in God and to lose and waste time. As in this week we see how Mary of Bethany wasted a lot on the Lord. This costly ointment, it was broken completely over the feet of the Lord and so the aroma, aroma, filled the air and gave the Lord consolation in preparation for his burial. Something of that we need to put into our praise, remembering how the Lord did not have time for the one who criticized. Why this waste? And remember also his words, the poor you have with you always, me you do not always have. So we may be careful that if we're so much interested in not upsetting anyone at all by being slightly too long in church, that what will happen is this. The one who actually is the noisiest in complaining will be the one who will influence the quality of the praise of the whole assembly because the noisy one is the one that carries the day, depriving the vast multitude of what instinctively the good Christian soul knows to be actually correct. Indeed, some people are scandalized when they come to an assembly where having been used to another culture where Sunday worship is never less than an hour, they see how God is given short change. And I've heard from a priest friend of mine who was sent down to Lagos to be a missionary for three years. When he came back, he wanted to go straight back to Lagos and went back because after being exposed to what they had in celebratory mode, that is two hours of praise and worship, he couldn't actually bear this minimalistic notion of let it be as brief as possible, lest anyone be upset, lest the bock, the road, the boat be rocked. I just conclude, my friends, with something I wrote some years ago when reflecting on this issue of liturgy, because I noticed that what actually has happened is this. Whereas before, this element of being able to disappear in a cloud of glory 
was part of the heritage of the average Christian soul, even in the West as well as the East, now most assemblies are very wordy and it's become very mental, very intellectual, very cerebral. The mind, the grey matter is functioning all the time and the emotions sometimes are not elevated. It's a different mode. It's almost a form of Protestantism. And it occurred to me that we need to recuperate the element of the mystic, the mystic, the mystic. We need an experience of something different from ourselves. And it occurred to me that actually in wanting to have something always intelligible, we have become but brain, but grey matter, and the heart finds no more place to be healed. So I wrote this regretting somewhat of the way in which unless we travel a while to find somewhere where gear is taken for the things of God, what we have is hurried praise and little elevation, if we're not careful. So this was my pain, as I thought, on what sometimes we miss when we're too much in a hurry to give lots of gratuitous time to the God who is outside time. Rumbling under the Vatican lines written after hearing of the possibility that the old right would be made possible again over the Catholic world there travels in the air a mighty noise of missives made of syllables that fire the dormant cells of matter grey in poise between apathy well fed and passion higher than some did deign to think. We winked at all the fumblings high liturgic that all hell mid limelight bright and brighter did install by dint of meaning better than was well. We bombed the heavy centuries at will and built square scaffolds theoretic high but there are whiles that would at whiles be still and for naught but a grain of incense for there are times when time trims not its God, and gazings where in Kronos stands. Unshod.
Oh, this stupid old man, you know.